This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. A man died after a long, fruitful life. The funeral was beautiful with honest tears and words of appreciation from family and friends. As he headed off to the pearly gates, he felt some confidence that his just reward was just around the corner. When he arrived at the gates, he was surprised to find himself face to face with St. Peter, who at that moment was looking none too happy to see him. St. Peter looked up from his desk beside the gates, rather impatient at this interruption. What do you want? He asked. The man found himself trembling a bit. Well, uh, to, to enter heaven, if you don't mind. St. Peter looked him over in silence, and then opening his book to a blank page and taking a pen, he began to ask a series of questions. What have you done with your life? The man said, I was a doctor. I took care of sick children in the community. I loved them and I think they loved me. St. Peter gave him a serious look and then nodded five points. The man was startled. His church hadn't told him anything about points required to get into heaven. St. Peter asked anything else. Well, said the man, I was a good father, patient with my children. I guided them well. Again, St. Peter looked up and down and then spoke seven points. The man was now clearly worried. How many points does it take? St. Peter answered, a lot more than you have. What else? I taught Sunday school for 10 years in the youth department at my church. St. Peter didn't look up this time, two points. I always bought candy and stuff from the kids selling for the school. Again, St. Peter didn't look up, one point. The man was sweating by now. I helped the family down the street when the creek flooded their house. St. Peter grunted, one point. The man was in distress, one point, God help me. The only way I'll get into heaven is by the grace of Jesus Christ. At this, St. Peter smiled, put down his pen and said, bingo, come on inside. What does it take to gain a home in heaven one day? Or more to the point, what is the faith by which we live in the present that we can look back over our lives with confidence and even joy? In the letter to the Philippians, Paul addressed the various strains in the early church. In the course of addressing those strains, he spoke of the faith that really transforms life. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 3 this morning. I hope you will get your Bible so you can read along with me. As you're finding your Bible and turning to Philippians 3, let us listen as our parish adult choir sings with a voice of singing.
Now, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, we begin with verse 2. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain, obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have obtained. God's word for God's people. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we receive this word. Let it be for us life teaching, and a signpost pointing so clearly to your presence among us. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Paul's letter to the Philippians is a beautiful statement of the Christian faith, woven into a series of warnings against those who would undermine that faith. In the course of the letter, he strikes out against several opponents, those who were personally opposed to Paul and trying to undermine his teaching those who are persecuting the Philippian church from the outside, those Paul describes as enemies of the cross of Christ who appear to be teaching an anything-go sort of living under the banner of Christ, and finally those addressed in our passage this morning who teach the necessity for Christians to keep the whole of the Jewish law. As Paul speaks throughout this letter, he speaks of faith in a manner that is distinctly different from the usual manner in which we speak. We usually think of faith as a, a, a statement of loyalty, like the commitment we make when taking an oath of office or joining the military. Are you ready to sign up and believe what we believe and do what we do? A second related understanding of faith is the body of beliefs that we either get right or do not get right. Do you keep the faith as handed down from the saints, or are you a heretic of some kind? But I hear Paul speaking of faith in a third distinct and invitational way. He speaks of faith as that life-giving principle within the believer. And maybe the word principle is misleading. Faith in Christ for Paul is a source of life like a clear spring flowing out of the rocks on a hot day you'll hear this joyful understanding of faith as we study this passage. Adam Hamilton in his book, Seeing Gray in a World of Black and White, points to such a joyful faith. He said, it, it seems to me that increasingly there are large swaths of the Christian population who are yearning for a middle way. There are self-described evangelicals who are embracing elements of the social gospel and who are open to insights from historical critical methods of biblical study. There are self-described liberal Christians who are embracing elements of the evangelical gospel, who are speaking of their personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and who are learning to give evangelistic altar calls 
while still championing social justice. And perhaps exemplifying this trend, there are those who describe their faith as emergent or postmodern and who yearn for a generous orthodoxy. Think about your idea of faith. Too often in the public arena, we hear faith described as a body of beliefs that we either get right or get wrong. We use our beliefs as a boundary, which marks the line between those who we trust and those who we do not, between those we will work alongside and those we won't, between those who are like us and those who are not. When we use faith this way, we take all the joy out of it. We brandish Christ as a weapon to wield in the culture wars of the day instead of commending Him as the Savior who draws all people to Himself. To believe in Christ is to experience life abundant. Not because people are like us, but because people are more and more like Christ. Second, Fred Craddock in his commentary on this passage pointed out that the Philippians reflects a, a distinct way of coming to faith. In making this point, he began by pointing out ways of coming to faith that are not reflected in this passage. They might be good and effective for many of us, but they are simply not present in the Philippian letter. One you won't find in Philippians is that which finds Christianity a, a better religion and therefore attractive to anyone always on the lookout for improvement of one's station, fortune, and peace of mind, not to mention prospects for the hereafter. Paul's testimony as to the surpassing worth of life in Christ has to do with abandoning such a search altogether, not having a righteousness of one's own, but trusting solely the grace of God. The other kind of religious experience not supported by this text is that which views the past as totally negative, a failure in every way. Certainly there are those who become Christians out of a background of confused values, wasted opportunities, inner turmoil, and social wreckage. The fact is not to be denied nor treated lightly, but the pattern is not to be imposed upon Philippians as it sometimes is done. We do not have in this text the portrait of a man at war with himself, crucified between the sky of God's expectations and the earth of his own paltry performance. So how have, how have you and I come to Christ? What was the motive? What was the, the place of your faith beginnings? What was the movement from your beginnings to your present faith? This movement that brought us to faith has a powerful impact on the faith we live each day. One person was a mess and faith cleaned up a life that was a wreck. Another person was going nowhere, at least nowhere good, and faith gave direction and purpose to life. Still another person was doing well but still wanted to do better. Faith in Christ offers a life that promises even more self-improvement. Yet another person was looking for a community of welcome, so they came into the fellowship the specific beliefs about Christ are not well formed yet, but just keeping company with those who know Christ is enough. So how would you describe your journey to Christ and faith? Have you come to know Christ as deeply as you want? Has this faith had an impact on your life that you want to see? Maybe it's time for soul searching. Maybe it is time for a little talk with Jesus. Paul describes the place where he began his journey of faith this way. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, Paul began his journey of faith from a confident life of law-keeping. He knew the ground from which he was birthed. He knew who he was in Judaism. He was confident that he kept the faith into which he was born. And in the very next verse, he says without reservation, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. The move from Judaism to Christ was not a self-improvement project. It was a giving up of the past in order to receive Christ. 
for him the present and his future. The move from Judaism to Christ was not because Paul hit rock bottom. He was proud of his earlier life. To turn to Christ was just that, a turn from a life that was an early life based on Paul's strength and accomplishments to a life that depended on Christ and his accomplishments. A grandfather at Bible study the other night told us about sitting with his granddaughter for a few hours recently. He said he had plenty to do. People may have been looking for him, but he gave himself to spending the morning with that three-month-old child. He said, as long as I was holding my granddaughter, nothing else mattered. This is the sort of turn to Christ that Paul experienced. He had plenty to do in his early life. He had a career. He had people who depended on him. But when he turned to Christ, the relationship with Christ filled him so much that he set the past aside without a second thought. Imagine giving yourself to Christ with that same sense of abandon and, and immersion. In the presence of Christ, every other claim and commitment is given a different priority. To know Christ is to be immersed in Christ. To know Christ is to enter the most important relationship of our lives. Now third, a word in verse 15 caught my attention. I wanted to call it to your attention. In verse 15, Paul says, let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. The word that caught my attention is mature. What does it, what does it mean to be a mature Christian? The Greek word Paul uses, teleos, has a special technical meaning. It signifies an end, a goal, a limit, and it combines dual ideas. First, the full development of one's powers, and second, the attainment of some goal or standard the realization of the proper end of one's existence. So our word mature has come to mean complete or full grown and implies ripeness in character and experience. It is used of the full development of adulthood as compared with the immaturity of childhood. Every church and every organization looks for those mature workers and leaders who can provide the wisdom and decision making that will move everyone forward. Business, military, the political arena have clear ways to identify and employ people at their various levels of maturity. The problem, and it is a problem for us in the church, is that the designation mature has been used to set certain people apart from the rest of us. The problem is that the church is that, is that we have memories of supposedly mature Christian leaders who have betrayed our trust. Every leader in Christ's church needs to keep a healthy sense of humility about him or herself. Human nature is to assume that the rules don't apply to us when we reach the top, when of course the rules do apply to leaders just as they apply to everyone else. Every leader in Christ's church must keep those persons around us who will tell us the truth in love, in every church, there are those wise persons who must be consulted and heard from time to time. They are a great treasure in any congregation. I have a Billy Graham story for you this morning. At the height of the Cold War, Billy Graham visited Russia and met with government and church leaders. Conservatives back home in America reproached him for treating the Russians with such courtesy and respect. He should have taken a more prophetic role, they said, by condemning the abuses of human rights and religious liberty. One of his critics accused him of setting the church back 50 years. Graham listened, lowered his head, and replied, I am deeply ashamed. I have been trying to very hard to set the church back 2,000 years. Where we will, will we find the mature Christian leaders for our time? Where will we, will we find the voices that can call the church and the world to the healing touch of Christ? The challenge of this time is to you and to me. Will we step forward, putting selfish loyalties and purposes aside to lead for the great work of Christ in the world? Will we step forward with a greater concern for Christ and His church than the concern we have for our comforts and our own honors? This is the leadership which the church and the world desperately need. Will we be those leaders 
Will we, finding those leaders, support them to do the necessary impossible? Paul spoke to a church troubled by enemies. Now, some of those enemies presented themselves as friends. It's just, it's just that they were not friends. If the young church had followed their lead, the church would surely have failed. Paul offered the leadership they needed to grow faithfully stronger. Paul offered the leadership they needed to follow Christ in a world of competing, destructive voices. Now, what about us? What has brought us to faith? What leadership do we offer? What conviction about Christ do we share with the waiting world? Far too many of us have given up on faith and given up on Christ. Let us return and lead again. Let us return and work again for the world where Christ is King of kings and Lord of all. He always has been, you know. Now let us listen as our parish handbell choir plays for us on variations on Heiferdahl.
want to invite you to worship with us now on Sunday morning at Church Street Church. Our services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. I would usually be inviting you to worship with us in the, gym, in the, in the nave, but this week repairs are going on uh, that force us to move to the gym. So if you come toward the back of the church, the, the gym is through the breezeway. I invite you to come there. We will have great worship, even in the gym. I invite you to come, 8.30 and 11. Also for midweek communion, again, not in the same place, but in room 204, but we invite you to come and to be a part of that service of worship, that time of communion there in the presence of God. As we come to the close of our time together, I am Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Tree United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. Now, as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye. You have just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Thank you.